As big as it gets, Pacers heat tonight. Not quite for the sixth seed, but pretty dang close. Where are the matchup advantages going to be? Can the Pacers pull it out? What is all at stake? Wes Goldberg from Locked On Heat and I going to break it all down on a bonus Locked On Pacers. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, y'all? Happy Saturday, Sunday, whenever you're tuning in, and welcome into another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers. As always, my name is Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and SI, and today it is the biggest day, game weekend, game day, whatever of the Pacers season remaining. One of their biggest games of the season, had they not reached the in-season tournament, semis, finals, whatever, it would be their biggest game of. The season, it's Pacers Heat tonight. The winner gets the tiebreaker. The winner is ahead and controls their own destiny for the sixth seed. Among many other important things involved for these two teams, it's going to be a huge game. Where can the matchups advantages come from? Can anything be learned from the games in November and December between these two teams in which Bruce Brown was the Pacers' leading scorer? What else is key to watch in this game, why is it so significant? Even beyond some of the stuff I've already said, well, Wes Goldberg, excuse me, from Lockdown Heat and I break all that down today to get you prepped for the Pacers' biggest game of the season. Let's just get right to it. Surprise! It's a crossover time because the playoffs actually start tomorrow for the Indiana Pacers and Miami Heat, who are effectively playing a play-in game to decide who may go to the play-in or the playoffs. It's as epic as it gets with a week to go in the season, which means we got to talk about it all. I'm Tony East. I host Locked on Pacers. Now, on the other side is... Is this part where I talk? <laughs> the synergy, man. We're ready. <laughs> Wes Goldberg from Locked on Heat. Let's do this. Uh, Friday night, both teams won. Big games against Western Conference teams, which sets this up absolutely perfectly to be as awesome of a game as you can get in the regular season. I tweeted it last night, Wes. You know everything that's at stake. Would you like me to read them for everyone right now? I would love if you did that. Okay, the Pacers, as it stands, are 44 and 34. The Heat are 43 and 34, tied in the loss column, meaning the loser will have more losses. So here's what's at stake. The winner ends the night in six. They'll have 34 losses. The Sixers and the loser will have 35. Uh, the winner... Gets the head-to-head -head tiebreaker between the Pacers and Heat. They split those two games in Miami in late November, early December, which we'll talk about in a second. So, huge for the tiebreaker. The winner also gets the top spot in the Pacers-Heat Sixers three-way tiebreaker. Catch here. The Pacers would clinch the top spot in that three-way tiebreaker. The Heat would have it, but the Heat would have to finish with a better East record than the Sixers. They currently have it and have two games against the Raptors to clinch it very easily, but they don't guarantee it by winning. They basically do. Uh, and the winner controls their own destiny for a postseason no play in berth. The loser does not and require losses from other teams. Uh, capiche? <laughs> it's about as big as a regular season <laughs> game as you can get. It is, man. And this week, I don't know about Indiana Pacers basketball, but for Miami Heat basketball, it's already been sort of playoff week, right? A game against the Knicks on Tuesday. Philadelphia on Thursday with Joel Embiid back, and then a big game on the back-to-back -back uh, in Houston on Friday night. And then, of course, this one, which both teams for a few weeks now have had circled on the schedule. This is a must-win, basically, for both teams here. Um, obviously, these these teams are one and one on the season. That's part of the reason why this is such a big deal is because it serves as a tiebreaker. They only play three times this year. But they're, what, what makes this game interesting, Tony, is also... The two times these teams played was one of those weird, like, back-to-back -back kind of baseball series things. They haven't seen each other since the early December. It was November, what was it, November 30th, November 30th and December, December 2nd. 2nd. Yeah, yeah, December 2nd. So it was like this weird, like, little Thursday to Saturday weekend kind of matinee thing happening. And um, Halliburton didn't play in the second game, I believe. And, you know, the Heat had some guy, the Heat only had Bam Adebayo for one of these games. So, like, they've seen each other. But it's been a while, and even when they did see each other, they weren't at full strength. The games were really exciting, both teams scoring a lot of points. So those games did kind of play into the like the Pacers style. But Miami's defense has been so good and holding teams like 
five five of the last eleven teams they've played, uh, five of the last twelve teams they've played under a hundred points. So they've been getting teams to play more of their style lately, but like the Pacers' strength is to get people playing sort of in their backyard. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens on Sunday. I agree, and I, I it's funny because I naturally was inclined to do what you just said. Let's go back and look at those first two games. Let me just rattle off some nonsense <laughs> so we can throw those games out pretty quickly. Okay, so the lowest score of the four scores, so two Heat scores and two Pacers scores from those two games was 129, which is just, <laughs> like, sounds fake. The leading scorer for the Pacers in their win over the Heat was Bruce Brown, who is now on the Toronto Raptors. Josh Richardson scored in double figures for the Heat in both games. Yep, Um, he's out for the season. He is out for the season. Buddy Heald scored in doubles figures for the Pacers in both games. He plays for Philly. Yes, he's now on the Philadelphia 76ers. Uh, Kyle Lowry was very good in both games. (laughs) Also plays for Philly. For the Miami Heat, he also plays for Philly. So on one hand, yeah, there's the Sixers did all of their pre-trade deadline scouting during this game. (laughs) They're like, those two guys are good. (laughs) So there's some stuff you can take from these. Obviously, Jimmy was fantastic. Jaime Hawkins was very good. Yeah, Miles Turner in the game, Bam didn't play was good. Obi Toppin was good in both games. But there's also like the teams look totally different. Terry Rozier was not involved. Pascal Siakam was not involved. Like. It's almost hard to look at those and take anything away because of that and because, obviously, with stakes, games will be played differently. They're not going to look like, – I would be shocked if either team hits 130 tomorrow night. I don't know about you. I would be surprised by that also because of the way the Pacers are playing now. They have slowed down a little bit. They're not yeah. scoring at the same rate as they did before. Part of that is Halliburton. Part of that is just a different – like it feels like stylistically they're a little bit more comfortable in the half court than they used to be. So that's like it's almost a pro like for for Indiana too but um the the number one thing if you're the Miami Heat is how do we stop Tyrese Halliburton and I I know like he just he hasn't been 100% because he isn't 100% but this guy he has torched the heat over the last 2 years basically it was two, it was last season where he had the game winning three pointer from like 37 feet out or something Christmas ish right yeah. yeah and then um and then he had something like 40 points or whatever it was earlier this year against Miami. The Heat have had a hard time defending like apex guards over over the last couple of years too. Um, Terry Rozier has provided a little bit of like, you know, attaboy interference, but it's not a whole, like you just not, they don't have like that stopper. You know what I mean? They don't have um, like a Derek White on the roster that that's able to really kind of corral those guys. So, you know, you see, uh, a couple nights ago, Tyrese Maxey goes off against them for 37 points. Jalen Green had his moments uh, for the Rockets last night in Houston. And uh, and Halliburton has basically had his way with Miami's defense. So I'll be really interested to see what they do. From an X's and O's standpoint, if we want to get into a little bit of that, like the Heat have been switching a little bit more lately. Uh, they have been zoning up earlier in games uh, when 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 they're facing these kinds of scoring guards. Um, so they're, they'll, they'll just... Spo will just go to the zone real quick. He'll push that button early in the game. Um, and they've been sending two to the ball a lot, um, you know, and, and and pressuring 94 feet also. So they they tend to throw they don't they don't really have like one look that they go with. They go with like a lot of different things. And you got Spolster on the sideline just like pulling different levers and going and toggling through these different uh schemes. But man, Halliburton, like he's smart, man. Like that, like that stuff doesn't work against him. He's like, okay, this is what you're doing. I can I can do this and because he's a good shooter and a good passer, he can do all that stuff. But my question to you, Tony, is like, what have you seen from Halliburton lately that would either, you know, give you confidence that he can kind of hit those numbers again? Or, or are you a little worried about where he is with this hamstring and just sort of his health overall? He's played better the last couple weeks. Still not, you know, whatever you'd call what he was doing in November, December, but much better. He said the franchise assist record last night against OKC, which I'm not just saying to gas him up. I'm saying to say... The Thunder tried to make him not a score. They said, you know, we're sending mm-hmm. two to you every time. Get it out of your hands. He's like, okay, <laughs> whatever. That's fine. Siakam has 21 points on 10 shots. Aaron Neesmith has a really good shooting game. Miles Turner has 16 points in like 18 minutes of play. They just carved him up because he's that's what he's good at is what you just described is like teams throw a weird coverage at him for like four possessions. The Pacers go, what? Huh? And then they figure it out. And then you have to keep adjusting on the fly. So gimmicky adjustments with him and Carlisle too. They're like the Pacers third quarter net ratings, like top five in the league, because mm. when they have a break, 
to talk about stuff and figure it out. They're very good. They are going against the tactician in Spolstra in the league. So it's not as easy as it is against other teams, but I wouldn't be so worried as the Pacers about what the, the heat throw uniquely at Tyrese Howard, because at times he can just get the three going and break that stuff up. The gimmick that's going to be tough is the Pacers have for better or worse been saved a lot recently by TJ McConnell. He's been playing unbelievably well yeah. since the all-star break 15 points a game, almost great passing. His energy is really impactful. Their bench units have been good because of him. The biggest way that teams try to bust up units where he's tearing them up is zone. Cause he can't shoot. And the heat are just the best in the league at one possession, throw at your zone or some weird zone or just, you, you know, it. you know, that, yeah. <laughs> that's what that's supposed thing. And so, that is where I feel like the rhythm of the Pacers can be broken up as they turn to now McConnell plus Halbert in lineup sometimes or McConnell plus Siakam as the two ball handlers because their bench has been so good. That'll be a lot harder, I think, against Miami. Yeah, the difference between teams that play zone and the Heat that play zone is that it's part <laughs> of the Heat strategy, right? Like yes. this team practices zone. They practice zone in October before the season even starts, and they're using it almost at a night, on a nightly basis. And so I would expect in this game, as soon as Halliburton goes out, they will go to the zone exclusively when TJ McConnell is in. Because the other part of that is Miami's personnel. Um, if we're talking about second units, then you get a lot of like Kevin Love at center. You know, you might have Tyler, you're going to have Tyler Hero coming off the bench. And and like I would expect TJ McConnell to try to get Hero into the action, run yep. some pick and roll. Um, so they're, they're going to they're gonna zone up. And then in that second unit, they bring Haywood Highsmith into the game, Caleb Martin into the game, I mean, Hakka's into the game. So they, they start throwing those long wings in there, and you'll get a guy like Highsmith at the top of that zone trying to screw things up early in the in the shot clock, and he's been really good at doing that. So um, I think we're going to see a lot of zone almost. I, I would imagine that, like, as soon as, like, everybody's going to have, like, a shot caller on the Heat's defense, and as soon as TJ McCall enters the game, they're all going to be shocked into, into his zone. I think they'll, they'll almost exclusively exclusively be in that. Um, the Pascal Siakam piece to me is the most interesting thing to me because if Halliburton's going to be – like you mentioned um, Oklahoma City trying to make Halliburton into a, a passer. I would imagine that's what Miami is probably going to do. That was their strategy against Jalen Brunson on Tuesday night. And, um, you know, it worked, you know, uh, to varying degrees. Like they turned Dante Divinc – it was like, we're going to turn Dante DiVincenzo into a scorer. And he was like, cool, I'm going to score 31 points. And they're like, all right, maybe right. that – Maybe not that much of a score. Uh, and uh, so that's sort of the other part of it. It always like, sounds right. better than it looks, doesn't it? Right. Yeah. It's like, oh, wait, he just <laughs> Malachi Flynn went off for 50 points. What? <laughs> like, <laughs> um, we didn't mean to turn you into Kevin Durant for a night. But um, so, uh, yeah, they'll 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 have to do that. So that, that that's why I bring up Pascal Siakam is, all right, if you're going to turn Halliburton into a passer, you don't want him turning Pascal. You don't want Pascal Siakam to go full-blown Super Saiyan Pascal Siakam either, right? Like, you yeah. need to limit him also, and that's where I think the Bam Adebayo versus uh, Siakam thing is going to be interesting. If if they even go that route, the Heat have been starting Nikola Jovic at power forward. I, I think they'll probably go Nico versus uh, Miles Turner here uh, just to put some size on him and then have Bam guard Siakam. And I dig it. Boy, is that interesting. <laughs> that's interesting because if you put bam and siakam on an island be like hey guys hey all nba forwards uh slash centers slash whatever you guys are freak athletes versatile players you guys are on an island have fun we're gonna have this matchup over here and then the rest of miami's defense putting two to the ball on tyrese coming off of ball screens all these things like it's it it could be fascinating I like that you mentioned Pascal. I think that is a huge storyline from this game, given the changes uh, from last time. You know what else is a big storyline, Wes? It is FanDuel, our great friends who know that the sports calendar right now is as good as it gets. Loaded. And FanDuel is making it even more exciting, Wes, to get in on the action right now because if you're a new customer on FanDuel, you can get two hundred dollars in bonus bets right now with any winning five dollar bet that's a lot of money that's 200 bucks you can use to bet on the tourney mlb nba nhl everything's clicking down there in miami and so much more to get that though you have to go to fanduel.com slash locked on that's how you can get 200 bucks with any winning five dollar bet fanduel.com slash locked on make your first bet a big win 
on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So on FanDuel, Ooh. Uh, the six man of the year odds still heavily favor Malik Monk, who is out for the season. Nas Reed has been climbing up the board, but you could still get him at plus 145. I wonder why the voters will re I, like, will the voters vote for somebody who's injured for the season? It shouldn't disqualify him because he's still going to make the 65 game limit. Malik Monk will, but just because he's out for the year, I do wonder if like voters in their head just sort of like almost you like disqualify him maybe subconsciously or consciously. Nas Reed at plus 145, throw, sprinkle a little bit of cash on there. Why not? I will give no advice. TJ McConnell should win. Let's talk Siakam. So to, to the, you just nailed the two things that are going to stand up. One of the two things that's going to stand out about that matchup to me. One is if the Heat do cross match, I think you're right that they will because we've seen the Pacers sprinkle in more recently, even just to start a possession, not even to like do an action. Siakam will just screen for Halbert to see what the defense will do. Are they going to switch mm -hmm. right away? Are they going to do nothing? Like, how's that going to impact what they do the rest of the possession? And, you know, it's easy to not switch that if you're a defense, but then all of a sudden maybe it's a screen that actually opens something up or an action can get started. And, of course, he's very good. He had 21 points on 10 shots last night, right? The Siakam thing that I am maybe the most intrigued by is, look, at, for all of time since TJ Warren's Pacers existence, Jimmy Butler has just – crushed this this Pacers team I mean it's they can't guard big wings in it at all they really have struggled against Jimmy uh now they have someone for those matchups not that Siakam's amazing at that kind of stuff but he's like the right size it's not Aaron Neesmith it's not a center it's not Obi Toppin slow feet it, it makes sense so Jimmy in that second game or excuse me the first game had 36 and took 20 free throws he earned them I'm not a Jimmy hate, hate foul hater in the second game, Jimmy Butler had 33 with nine free throws. They just struggle with him, and I wonder how much Siakam guarding him, as much as that's actually going to happen versus Aaron Neesmith guarding him. Aaron Neesmith just had a wonderful game defending LeBron James about a week ago. One foul in 39 minutes on LeBron. It was very impressive. Um, I wonder what they're going to be able to do to him that they haven't been before because they have forwards they can put on him for a whole game and not just parts of a game. And so Siakam, I mean, we on both ends is going to change kind of even all the history of Pacers heat. And that doesn't even account for the other thing I want to get to in a minute, which is one of these teams has made the finals twice in the last three years. The other team hasn't made the playoffs at all in the last three years. So <laughs> there's just a lot of fun dislodging factors from these teams. Yeah, uh, the defense against Jimmy Butler is going to be interesting because we, it, Jimmy is such an interesting player at this stage of the season. It. it <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to figure out, okay, is he just waiting for the playoffs? Is he trying to save whatever like kind of fuel he's got left in the gas tank anymore? And the, the Miami Heat go as Jimmy Butler goes. That's not surprising. Most teams go as their star goes. But it, it's, it, you know, it's just, it's sort of an open-ending question until until tip-off, and then you kind of see how how engaged Jimmy Butler is. Is he is he sprinting in transition? Is he... Uh, trying to get to the rim, or is he sort of just walking into post ups and and kicking out? And you know, is it playoff Jimmy or is it not? Essentially, and when they get a very engaged sort of pedal to the metal Jimmy Butler, this team can beat anybody. And when they don't get that, then all of a sudden that trickle down effect, it's there's a lot more on Bam's shoulders to score. There's a lot more on Terry Rozier to bail him out on the end of the shot clock. There's a lot more on a guy like Tyler Hero who came back on Friday night after being out to score and lift the offense and basically run things for pockets of a game. Um, they need, obviously, like if there was a time for playoff Jimmy Butler to come out and play, it would be Sunday, right? <laughs> like this yeah. is yes. like, this is a playoff game. For all intents and purposes, this is it. Like, hey, Jimmy, you want to, hey, how about this? You want to take a week off so you don't have to do the play-in tournament? Go out and win this win, game. Win this one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then we'll give you that week off, buddy. Um, so he's been better. He scored um, 20 points two nights ago, 22 against the Rockets on Friday. Still not quite there at that level, but starting to starting to get there. So if you're a Heat fan, I guess you feel a little better about that. But still, I, I have no idea what to expect from Jimmy. Um, I think Aaron Neesmith is a really interesting guy because we talked about how long it's been since these teams have played, November and early December. Aaron E. Smith has been through the Pokemon Elite Four since then. Like, he's leveled up. Like, that dude is better now than he was before, yes, right? Yes, he like, is. that guy, if Jimmy Butler is not fully in it, he can guard Jimmy Butler. Like, Aaron E. Smith at this stage, he can guard Jimmy Butler if Jimmy Butler is not bringing it. 
And if that's the case, that frees up Pascal Siakam. That frees up so much of everything else that Indiana wants to do 100%. defensively. So if Jimmy Butler has to put the stress test, like the John Taffer bar rescue stress test, on the Pacers' defense early in this game and set the tone, because if you don't do that, then what happens is what we talked about earlier, Tony. It's like then the Pacers get to take hold of the tone. They get to create the terms of engagement. And if that's the case, and now we're playing an up-and-down game, I think the Heat can play that way, If we, as we've seen. These teams played that way for two games, and they split it, but they would prefer not to. While we're talking about players who have leveled up and can change this game, Jaime Hawkins, <laughs> uh, <laughs> obviously. He was good against the Pacers in like it was like his 15th career game <laughs> at yeah. the time, and he's obviously better now. And the Pacers have changed their defense and their principles since then. But the way he kind of plays and the stuff he's good at is stuff that the Pacers in general are kind of willing to live with, mm -hmm. given what they want to give up. And he, he's like, okay, <laughs> I'll just I'll just drop in this five to eight footer all night on your team. And especially when he's playing with Jimmy or with another wing, whoever that may be, Haywood Highsmith, whoever. He, I think he's going to be really tough for the Pacers to match up with again. Like they just don't have the right guy to put on him. And so if he can do, I think in the first game he had 20 something when these two teams played and the second game, he wasn't as good. If he's that good again, where he's just backing down twice, turn over a shoulder, shoot, score Jaime Jaquez all night. Then I think they have to think about, do we put someone different on him and who do we put mm -hmm. on Jimmy? And do we have to go bigger more than we thought? Like does Obi Toppin have to play a bunch of minutes tonight? And then your defense suffers in other places. So as much as D Smith can, in theory, be a guy who stresses Jimmy out, Hawkes can come in and just neutralize that by being another sizable scorer for the Heat. Yeah, it depends. Like, so Jaime has run into a little bit of the rookie wall lately. That guy has played uh, so many minutes, so it's many so games tough for, for the them Heat. at this point. And yeah. yeah, and for a rookie who's not used to playing an 82 game season uh, on this Heat team that has been so injured, four, fourth or fifth most games lost due to injury this season. 35 different starting lineups like this team has been through it but through it all Jaime's basically been the most healthy guy and he's been asked to sort of reprise a Jimmy Butler role at times he's been asked to just come off the bench and run the second unit almost as a backup point guard sometimes and and everything in between uh he hasn't scored 20 points um in more than a month so wow. it, it's been a little rough for him. Um, and, you know, he had, he had 12 against Houston Friday night on five of seven shooting. It was nice. But, you know, the rebounds are a little bit down. The assists are a little bit down. Frankly, like Eric Spolster is not running as much stuff for Jaime anymore. And now with Tyler Hero back and part of that second unit, it looks like Tyler Hero is just going to come off the bench for the rest of the, the regular season here as he works his way back from this injury. Um, now you've got Jaime probably playing off of Tyler Hero. And and what does that look like? So that'll be interesting to see if Spo tries to get Jaime in the post a little bit more, maybe run some split cuts for Tyler to get him those off the catch stuff that Spo is always trying to create for Tyler Hero. Um, or if he's just like, Tyler, just go do your thing and, and Jaime will fit in and find his play, place. And he's good at that too. He could do the backdoor cuts and he could do all the screens and he could do all that kind of stuff also. So um, yeah, I mean, if, if Jaime Jaquez were to have a good game against the Pacers, that would be big for the Heat, not just for this game, obviously, as sort of an, a swing factor, but it would also mean, oh my God, like Jaime's back, you know, and it would have like much bigger repercussions potentially for the Heat too, if if Jaime can have a little bit of a bounce back game here, because you know physically he just looks a little bit worn down, and that's understandable, but it's just a tough place to be at this stage in the season. One more thing I want to get to, actually two more. One is I spelled experience wrong on our graphic, and I just noticed it 22 minutes in. So that's really exciting. <laughs> Not going to fix that. <laughs> two is, actually a third one. Two is, not only is winning this game about making the playoffs, the chance of playing the Cavs instead of possibly Boston yes. is like, is like un This is the most important game on the schedule for so many reasons. Yeah. The Bucks aren't the Bucks aren't like so threatening to the Heat specifically, but like even just a chance you play Boston instead of anyone else is yeah is no. Uh, I mean there there is such a gap between to me the Celtics and the rest of the Eastern Conference, yeah, and the okay. way I keep framing this is if you took the league and you broke the league out in tiers, right? You'd have Denver and Boston probably top tier. Uh, yep. There. Okay. And then second tier, you would have like Oklahoma City, Minnesota. That would, uh, probably them, right? That next tier would be teams like the Mavericks and the Clippers. Clippers, yeah. We're still not getting to an Eastern Conference team. 
right. I might have put the Bucks in that third tier before this week where they've lost like three what the heck it's, games. This in is a row. sort of what made me think about it, right? Like yeah. you lose to Washington, you lose to Memphis. You're like, are you, do you know what And the, Toronto? <laughs> and Toronto. You're like, do you, you understand what's happening right now, right? Like yeah. these are basketball games going into the playoffs. It's time to get your stuff together. <laughs> the wheels are coming off at the worst possible time. You get to that fourth tier, and I think now you could put Milwaukee in there, but now you're talking about like New Orleans. Like yeah. And which is a playing team, maybe Phoenix you throw in there. Like we're getting like four tiers down. So my the point of me saying this is the Celtics are the team to beat. It goes the East goes through Boston. There's no doubt about it. But if you can get A out of the playing tournament, boom, enough of a bonus already. If that was not a motivating factor, it should be. Two, you get to play Cleveland in the first round potentially as that three six Orlando, Milwaukee, whatever. As yeah. yeah. Uh and like that, that's such a better result than having to yes. maybe play Milwaukee or Boston in the first round. And then um, and then the other part of it, too, is that you're on the Milwaukee side of the bracket if they stay in this two, yeah. uh, two seed. So if you beat, and you should beat Cleveland because they just they don't look like a serious team right now, then, okay, Milwaukee is eminently beatable. So you get to postpone a potential Celtics matchup all the way into the conference finals. And... The other version of this is you're in the play-in tournament in that 7-8 game. You have to probably play Philly at this point with Joel Embiid back, so that's not a guarantee. So you could easily lose a one-game matchup against Embiid if he just goes MVP for, for 48 minutes. And now you're playing one of the, like the, okay, now you have to play the 9-10 matchup against Chicago or Atlanta, and now you're backing into a Celtics matchup in the first round. Like, there's so much yeah. at stake here, not just to avoid the play-in tournament, but everything that happens after that, Tony, is... It, it could literally de define the playoffs. It could determine whether or not you are a loser in the first round or if you make the conference finals. It's that level of a difference. I I, I don't want to poo-poo the Pacers' chances of making the conference finals, but the Heat the Heat's expectations for what they would do with the 16 and the Pacers are certainly different. Like, yeah. but uh, the a chance to win a series and a chance to win more games and get more information about your young team is still way better than just getting swamped by the Celtics machine in four games and learning very little about your team. And that's sort of like the last thing I want to talk about with this. I alluded to it earlier. The Heat were in the 2021 finals. They were in the 2023 finals. Been there, done that. They're very good. They know what they can do in the postseason. The Pacers have not played a playoff game since the bubble. Uh, there's a little bit mm -hmm. of a dichotomy in what these teams are. What was the last home playoff game for Indiana? Uh, the last in Indianapolis, yeah, not Indiana. Bubble. yeah. The the Celtics Pacers series in 2019 when Oladipo was out for the season. No, and, and Bowen Bogdanovich was wow, their number one offensive player. Yes, my my fun Pacers fact for a while has been that the currently whatever well they're not rebuilding anymore, but that the Thunder more recently have played a playoff game than the Pacers. The Boyan Bogdanovich area era is what we're talking about. <laughs> wow. So. Yeah, they, and they were good in the bubble, but sure. the, uh, the Heat know all about that Pacers first round series. I mean, they smoked them; it yeah. wasn't even close. Sabonis was out, so like caveats, but they would have lost anyway. But still, like that, you know, they they got their butts kicked. Um, I wonder how. So, if the Pacers had not played the in season tournament this year, like this would be the biggest game of Tyrese Halbert's career tonight, mm. like his entire career. Like that is th that that is how wide of an experience gap there is in this game. And I wonder how much that matters, if at all. It's it's such a great uh, point that you make too, because uh, if you're Indiana, it might even help you to, you <laughs> know, just like ignorance is bliss almost. It's <laughs> like, let's just go out there, play our game. We don't really know. And like the thing with the Pacers is they're not like they're a young team, yes, but they're like first of all, they're coached by Rick Carlisle, who is as is almost as experienced as it comes as a head coach. Like he's gonna have the team ready, like. So that's that's a big part of this. And then Halliburton just like you mentioned the 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 in season tournament. He loved that. Like he, yeah, yeah. he really was. took to the stakes of whatever it was that didn't really have any stakes, but he was in <laughs> he he was in on it, right? Like he was totally in. And then you got Pascal Siakam, who literally has won a championship, which is not something that anybody on the Miami Heat roster can say. So he at least has the ring. So I, I hear you. Uh, there's definitely going to be a youth thing there, but like TJ McConnell has been through it. Like that dude's been in the league for a long time. Uh, and he has, by the way, I'm glad you brought him up earlier because that is the guy that just looks like 
they're, they're, heat fans have a thing <clears throat> called random scrub heat killer. And, and it's not even like, like TJ McCollum ain't no scrub, but, uh, he would, he'll get the, uh, RSHK, um, label if he went, if, and when he goes off for 27 points on like eight for 12 <laughs> shooting or whatever it is. So, um, that's going to happen. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't know that the experience versus the youth is, is as big of a gap, uh, versus like maybe another more youthful team than, than Indianapolis, because they've, they've been able to Indianapolis, um, uh, Indiana, but they've been able to (laughs) rise to the challenge. But the thing with the heat is yes, they are experienced. They know what they have to do. They will bring it. Everybody. I am very confident in saying that except for, for Jimmy Butler. Like I just, I don't mean to keep hammering this point, but like if he's engaged, the heat win this game. And I could say it confidently. If he's a little wobbly, then it becomes much more of an interesting game. Wes, I believe you just shortchanged one of the players in the Miami Heat when you said that Siakam has a ring. Patty Mills oh. is an NBA champion. Sorry, Patty. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. Of all the players that are going to play in this game, uh, I mean, Patty Mills. Yeah, I, I tend to forget about that 2014 championship for some reason. <laughs> they played the Heat in the series. <laughs> Right. Uh, I had to look up their roster. I was like, that sounds right, but I'm not certain. I'm looking forward to this. I can't wait. Um, this is the highest, again, highest stakes game of the Pacers regular season. Obviously, their Lakers tournament game was more meaningful for them and a chance for them to make the playoffs, a chance for them to avoid Philly in a play-in game with Joel Embiid as the Heat saw Thursday doing Joel Embiid stuff. No Boston. Tiebreakers, everything, everything. Pacers, if they win, can close two and one mm. and get the six seed still. Mm-hmm. Heat will have four games left after, so I don't know their exact permutations, but it's probably just three and one because of the same things. And they play the Raptors twice in yeah. those four games. So that's not they get the Raptors good. twice. They have a back to back, um, Atlanta and then Dallas at home. So yeah, they could probably if they win on Sunday, they can afford to drop one of those games probably. But yeah, uh, playoff status, basketball reference, all the playoff odds tracking things, they basically have the Sixers and the Heat neck and neck because of this game. Uh, Sunday will, for the most part, unless something weird happens afterwards, determine who ends up with the six seed. Pacers final three is Toronto, Cleveland, Atlanta. And there's a chance that Atlanta has nothing to play for in that final game, depending on how the week goes. So some winnable games in there. Although the the Bucs just proved the Raptors are not to be uh, overlooked by either of these teams. (laughs) I guess not. It's not a walkover. (laughs) This was great, Wes. I hope we set the scene well for basically a play-in game before the play-in tournament. I can't wait. I know you can't either. What do you got going on after Pacers Heat? Oh, you know what's gonna what it's gonna be. We're gonna have a reaction recap of the game Sunday night, right after the game. Um, really excited uh, for, to to watch this on Sunday. It's been a good week of Miami Heat basketball, a lot of high stakes. Uh, and over at Locked On Heat, we've got the reactions for all the games. Pacers blew it against the Nets, which makes this game even more meaningful. But they've been playing decently yeah. well besides that game this past week. Same thing will be coming on Locked On Pacers after the game with the guest uh, and Wes. As my listeners know. I very frequently credit you guys when I use the term credit cookies or blame pie after game. So (laughs) perhaps I will steal some dessert phrases depending on how the game goes. (laughs) Hopefully it's not credit cookies for you guys. Hopefully we're (laughs) the ones handing them out. (laughs) I'll make sure to give it to the, what is it? Random heat role player. Random scrub heat killer. (laughs) Random scrub heat killer. RSHK. Every team thinks that's the case for them, though, isn't that? It's true. It? It's so true. Uh, the Heat fan base is the only one that I know who has put like a hashtag Monitor. and label to yeah. it. Yeah. Um, but every every fan base is always like, "Why do these players always go off against us?" I was like, "Number one, they don't, and number two, it's a NBA regular season. This stuff happens." Uh, number three, like example, Exhibit A: Malachi Flynn, fifty burger. Like this just happens. Like it just happens. Well, typically the answer is they're leaving that guy open on purpose. Right. And, yes. And he just happens to make shots that night. But Pagers fans will tell you that they think Terrence Ross is one of the best five players in the NBA because he always, <laughs> probably, always had thirty point games against the Pacers. Thank you everybody for tuning in. We'll have a lot more coming on both of our feeds after this game. Have a wonderful weekend, week, whatever. See you soon.